Okay. All right. So yeah, if you want to get started, feel free. Yep. I'm sharing my screen now. Maybe. Oh, I need permission. No, I can share screen. Never mind. Pretty sure I. I gave it all. No, you're, no you're, you're, I'm, I'm good. There you go. Okay. Everyone see this? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yep. All yep. right. So I'm going. Oh, the goal of this presentation is to develop mechanical intuition. Just a fancy way of saying uh, when you make something in SolidWorks, you know when you can punch holes and you know when you should punch a uh, like make a bend, but on a more intuitive level, other than Alan saying, "Oh, it makes it stronger." <laughs> nah, no, 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 not a diss on Alan. Just this is just trying to build up a, a better idea of what's of what's going on on a mechanical level. So uh, I was on a team for four years and I built three robots. We don't have to talk about the fourth. I go to A and M now. Um, that's all you really need to know about me. I'm in college. I'm like about to graduate college. So like, I think I know enough that I can talk to you about this stuff, but in reality, I really probably don't. So I'm going to go over FEA in this presentation, talk about what finite element analysis actually means. It's a long word. Basically, uh, my professors put it in a great way. It's a way of making pretty colors and, um, they can mean stuff if you do it right, but most of the time, all you're making is just pretty colors. Um, it's basically just a brute force method of analyzing how a part or an object kind of um, deforms and changes. Uh, it takes a lot of time to actually get good at it. You can make really, you can do really, really simple simulations, but anything that's re remotely accurate takes probably about a PhD or so of, of knowledge right now. Uh, it also takes a lot of com computational power. Anything that you want to do like over time, like with a car crash, for example, I was talking to researchers and they had to buy uh, like about a day or so of processing power on a supercomputer at AM. So why are we learning FEA for FRC robots if it's that freaking hard, right? Well, ideally, you're not going to be analyzing uh, big car crashes or anything super hard. Ideally, you'll be using it on smaller parts. And even then, the ultimate goal of going through this FEA presentation is that you kind of understand and develop how parts and solid objects on to form and move on a, on a more intuitive and a deeper level. Because when I was on a uh, spectrum, I didn't really understand anything other than like, uh, when you put, when you, when you put force on something it kind of bends, but like, I didn't really understand, um, how things are happening or what, what's happening inside of the part when you do that. I'll go over a bit more on what that actually means. So, uh, I'm not sure how many people here have taken physics or, uh, um, yeah, have taken, uh, yeah, it's just physics or even chemistry even. Um, mm -hmm. So basically a force, people are always gonna say a force equals mass times acceleration or they're gonna use a bunch of math and stuff to describe what force is. But at the end of the day, it's just a concept that says it's a number that represents how much an object is going to move. So we can take this beam, for example, right? And if I put a force, which is usually represented as an arrow, I put a force on it, there's nothing resisting that force, so it's just going to fly off to the right. People also describe force as a vector quantity. That's just another fancy word of saying that a force has direction and uh, magnitude. So what I mean by that is that when a force points somewhere else, like downwards, it also goes downwards. And if I make the force arrow longer, that means it has a higher magnitude, which means it goes down faster. So what happens if we actually keep a beam and have one end actually stay rigid and then put a force on it? So kind of in, in a pure physics standpoint, ideally the beam does not move. But if you take like a, like a piece of wire or a paper clip near you and you hold it up and you press on it, clearly it kind of moves into forms and uh, moves out of the way, right? So what's going on there? Well, when you press on it, it kind of it, it deforms like that, right? Well, we can reduce this, uh, this rigid joint at the end into a uh, reaction force over here. But if we don't, if we only reduce it to a single reaction force, it'll just spin and uh, not really be useful, right? So to counteract that rotational force, we also have to include a rotational counter uh, reaction force or a torque rather like that. So a force can be, is a, just something that represents how much an object 
tendency to move. And it's a vector quantity, which means that it's direction. And it can also be a rotational, uh, and it can also be represented in a rotational way. So when we uh, draw our free body diagram, that's what it's called, a free body diagram with no, no other uh, connections to it, we can now properly um, represent a rigid joint at the end like this, and it'll deform. But we still don't really quite understand why it deforms from a pure physics standpoint, right? Nothing in your physics classes will teach you why something deforms, and that's kind of what this presentation is going to deep dive a bit more into. By the way, I tend to talk really fast, so please let me know if you have any questions. Just jump in. The, doesn't, it won't bother me. So we're going to deep dive into some material science uh, kind of uh, before we can uh, really understand the mechanics of how something moves um, uh, on the inside or how, how something can deform, right? So we'll take an example of springs. So when you take a spring and you stretch it, it takes some force or some energy to stretch it out. And it also takes some energy to, to compress it. And it's very, very linear. So you can represent that as a simple multiplication. So when force uh, force times a spring constant, or sorry, force is a spring time, uh, spring constant times some amount of spring stretch, which is what the L stands for. Um, well, in an actual material like aluminum or plastics, they also have that springiness to it, but on a much uh, smaller scale, depend depending on how rigid or how brittle the material is. So even steel has some amount of stretch. You can, and that stretch comes from the actual chemical bonds inside of a material. So it's kind of a fancy uh, diagram, but all it just means is that um, when you stretch something hard, it takes uh, this. It takes some energy to um, to stretch it out, and if you compress it, it takes a lot more energy to get um, uh, to get it to compress more. If that makes sense, uh, you can kind of. Uh, it, it kind of explains why it's easy to tear things, but it's really hard to make things break by smushing it together. So in that regard, uh, just as springs have a spring constant, materials also have their own constant. Uh, these are called, uh, the, the, the constant is specifically called a Young's modulus. It's usually represented by the letter E. Um, this graph is a load versus extension, which all that just means is that's a force versus displacement, just like a spring. But instead, instead of using a spring, it's an actual material. So, uh, I can actually pull up a video of something uh, of a. Uh, give me a quick second. Yeah, I can pull up a video of a of a machine that's creating a force times a uh, force and a displacement um, plot. Hold up, let me. So I'm a boomer. I gotta I gotta open up YouTube and stuff. All right. So this is an example of stainless steel and a tensile tester. It's just being pulled really, really hard right now. You can't really see it because uh, steel is super, super rigid and really hard to stretch out. But over time, the machine uh, eventually gets to it. You can kind of see it kind of caving in in the middle like that. That just means that it's, uh, it's getting ready to break. And pretty soon, it's going to yield and, and fail at the end like that. So basically metals and materials are typically really, really uh, hard. So it takes a lot of energy to make them stretch a little bit, not like springs where it's really easy to, to make them move and um, uh, stretch and compress. Uh, get back to the presentation slides. Uh, wherever it went. Oops. So that's what this uh, little plot in the bottom right shows. Um, at the beginning, it takes a lot of energy to uh, get it to stretch. Towards the middle, it gets easier and easier. And at the very end, when it ends, that's when the material actually breaks and snaps. But when we want to use the Young's modulus to relate a uh, force, like an input force to a, or sorry, an input, uh, sorry, yeah. Whenever we want to use the Young's modulus to relate uh, an input force into a uh, resulting deformation, we can't simply use force and um, force and displacement. It's because when you test different objects, clearly when they have different geometries, different thicknesses, different uh, uh, shapes, 
they're all going to take different force, uh, amounts of force to get them to displace different amounts of uh, length, right? So we get around this by using an idea called stress and strain. Stress is basically force per unit area. So you standardize force across everything of different uh, shapes, sizes and shapes. And then you also do the same thing for strain where you convert, instead of just doing a pure length measurement, you do a percentage length. So if uh, say you have a, uh, one, or a, a 12 inch piece of material and then you stretch it really hard until it becomes 13.2 or it gains 1.2 inches, we say that that material has now has a strain of 10 or a, of 10% or 0.1. So next we go back to our original free body diagram. I promise all that was relevant. Uh, it might seem like a weird detour, but I promise it's relevant. So if we go back to our original free body diagram, um, we'll want to start analyzing what's actually happening inside of the beam instead of just seeing the forces on the outside. So imagine if I take a cut on the purple line what would the reaction forces be then if I deleted the left side of the beam? Of the beam? Remember that the beam still has to be static and rigid and, uh, cannot, be, uh, and cannot move. If we took that cut there, what would happen is we would just move this over. So we, ha we still have that linear force on the left side that reacts to the, our input force on the right. And we also still have the moment or the, uh, the torque on the left side that prevents the rotation. But because the beam is now shorter, the torque is also smaller. I represent it by making the arrow a little smaller. Um, so we can kind of see and analyze exactly what kind of forces are on a per slice basis of where along the, um, the beam, the, uh, we maybe take the cut. So if we move the cut all uh, really, really close to our initial um, input force, we'll have a really, really small torque and we'll have these two forces that kind of balance each other out. So the idea is if we move this cut infinitesimally close to, uh, like infinitely close to our input force, what would happen is we would kind of get this cube where we have our down force from our input force. We have this, we have this uh, um, down uh, force which is what we input. And we also have our reaction, which goes upwards. And we also have this torque still on the left-hand side. Because it's really difficult to work with uh, torques like this, we can generalize it and we can reduce it down to just two sets of arrows like this. And this is basically what a finite, this is what, what a single element really looks like when you do a finite element analysis. A uh, fully complete element looks like this when everything gets balanced out. Um, excuse me. So the uh, there are si there there are arrows on the on the. Uh, let me see if I can. Annotate. Oh, I can't annotate. Perfect. Okay. Can I spotlight these? Nope. All right. So basically, we have these arrows right here that represent the rotation of the cube. And we also have these arrows that represent how much that they will elongate in that direction. And because, uh, because we have to assume this cube does not move in space, everything has to be balanced out. So this force has to have a corresponding force over here. And then these two uh, red arrows, or these, these four red arrows um, all kind of counteract each other and prevent them from uh, the cube from just rotating infinitely in space. And we also have this blue arrow here that represents the other direction where it can elongate. Okay. Oops. Oh, I was going to say. Okay. So this is basically um, what a single element is when you do a finite element analysis. Uh, are there any questions on that? I went through that kind of quick, a lot quicker than I probably should have. Um, yeah, are there any questions? All right, I'll move over to SOLIDWORKS, which is actually more fun. Um, all right, we'll get that in a second. 
uh, SolidWorks being shared right now? Okay. Yep. So I'm going to open. So when you want to run a simulation, this will just be some uh, basic level um, FEA simulations. So I just made this quick rectangle. Um, it's just a, a flat piece of sheet. If I want to measure it, it's uh, 090, typical piece of sheet metal. I made it 6061. Um, and if I want to do a simulation on it, uh, what you do is you want to have a simulation tab. So you uh, if you don't have the simulation tab, you just right click up, up here, enable it, and then you can start a new study. Call this uh, static two or, yeah. And then uh, you have all these different simulation uh, options. You can do thermal simulations, you can do buckling, fatigue. But for now, we just wanna do a, a simple 2D uh, or simple static simulation. So we come down here. I've already have my material defined, but you always want to have that uh, there. Uh, say I want to simulate that beam that I had in the presentation. So what I'll do is you always want to start off with a fixture. Oops. Yeah. I'll start off with a fixture. And this basically just says, what surface do you want me to, do you want me to hold completely rigid? while uh, you can put forces elsewhere. So in this case, I just want one of, the, one of these ends to stay rigid, like in the little animation up here. So let's click that, I'll click the check mark. And now when I have an opposing force, no matter what, this will stay fixed in space and will not move. So if I wanna start putting loads on it, I'll go to external loads, add a load. And just like in the, uh, in the free body diagram I had in the beginning, the position of your load is important. So if I put it all over here, it's just gonna be distributed evenly across this whole um, piece of sheet metal. But if I wanna actually uh, load it at the edge like I did in the presentation, I'll click on the edge and then I'll choose the specific direction I want it to go in. Uh, first the direction and then I'll come up with some amount of force. I don't know my Newtons very well. I'll come up with something right now, like a thousand. All right, so now we have our fixture and our loads. Next is something called a mesh. So just like in the, uh, in the free body diagram, we have to define how many elements we want in this for our calculations. This is one of the harder parts of a simulation because you have to figure out exactly, uh, you have to figure out a generally good number that would accurately capture real life. Because if I made it a really, really um, coarse, uh, let's see if I can, yeah. If I made it really coarse, it'll use less elements. So I'll generate that. So I won't be able to capture any of the individual, any of the bending within this triangle, but I will be able to capture the relative motion from this uh, point to this point. So for now, I'll just start off with a coarse fixture or a coarse mesh so we can uh, not spend a bunch of time on the simulation itself. And I think that's everything. So I'll just run this for now. And it says there's an excessive displacement. Which that seems pretty reasonable. A thousand newtons is a lot of newtons. Uh, still solving. I might have made it too, I'm going to put too much force on it. <laughs> but yeah, while that's, while, while that's running, um, one of the hard parts about making FEA work for FRC specifically is that it's really difficult to accurately model bolts and uh, rivets. Um, if your rivets and bolts are strong enough, you can just kind of, you could probably just get away with modeling them as uh, completely rigid. But as you uh, engineer stuff and 
push things closer and closer to their limits of uh, their their factor safety limits, you have to be more aware of that and actually uh, do more calculations to make sure that your designs are are, are right. For FRC, um, most people just kind of overkill things with bolts, so they don't have to worry about that kind of stuff. You're also not using this for an extended amount of time in FRC, so uh, you can get away with less. Um, yeah, you can also get away with less in that regard. All right, I think I've really uh, made the simulation angry because I, I made that Newton, I made that load way too big. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can cancel this. All right, yeah, I just failed. Okay, we'll reduce this down a bit. Two hundred or something like that. Okay. Uh, do you have any questions in the presentation so far? I know. I think I went through the uh, the, th the theory way too fast. <laughs> I didn't mean to go through it that fast. Um, not really a question real quick, but apparently according to Siri, uh, 1,000 Newtons is 225 pounds of force. So uh, that seems like a lot. Yeah, that does seem like a lot, doesn't it? It's probably not ideal for this piece of sheet metal. It's like a foot wide or a foot long. Hopefully if I put like 50 pounds on it, maybe it's better. It's churning. So yeah, you can kind of understand why FEA simulations operate in such a weird middle ground. Like it's, it's such a narrow use case where we would use it in FRC because clearly if you've ever touched a piece of metal and played with it at all, you would know that this would just kind of bend at a curvature. Um, and it's really, really hard to find a case where you can find, uh, where you really want to do, you really want to test something that's um, close to its, its factor of safety. All right. So this is a deformed result. That's pretty, uh, that's, that makes sense. <laughs> Uh, when you put that much force on it, it'll it'll displace pretty aggressively. But uh, we can see the strain plot, which is this one. So we can see that all the strain happens way at the base, and none of it really happens at the tip. That makes sense. Whenever you whenever you're bending a piece of metal, all of the stretching occurs at the actual crease itself, at the actual at the actual bend. We can also see the displacement plot, which just means how far is it away from its original position. So it makes sense that the tip that we bent at goes really, really, um, go, is really high compared to the, um, the base. And finally, we can see the stress, which is basically, which basically just represents how much force each of these little particles are under. High stress means that uh, this area is prone to failure. Uh, it's 60, 61, so chances are it's going to snap and break there. So you can see this plot is really useful. It shows you the yield stress of the yield strength, which means that if any of your, if any element is above the yield strength, it will probably fail and uh, not return back to its original uh, shape. So anytime stress is under this orange arrow, it'll just spring back to its original uh, shape like an actual spring. Anytime it's over, it'll kind of, it'll permanently deform and it'll always be a little bit different from where you started up from. Uh, so this is a pretty simple example of a- um, Can you go back to displacement real fast? 
Yeah, of course. The the sorry the displacement. Yeah, the one. No, this one's, yeah. yeah. So, because part of it is the visual representation in SolidWorks isn't actually representative of how far it's going to move. Like it, depending on what you're doing, most of the time it exaggerates everything. So you do have to look at what the units are to see how far it's actually moving away. Okay. Um, so like a lot of times, because most of the times when you actually do this, you're seeing very, very small amounts of displacement and it'll exaggerate it to show you that it's moving. Um, then you have to look at the units and see. This one, I think it's actually getting pretty close because it's saying what, it's like 400 millimeters of movement or something? <laughs> yeah, it's a... It's half a meter in displacement. Yeah. So, like, that one might actually be real. Most of the time, it's like a bolt, and it's bending ever so slightly, and you see it, like, it looks like it's bending, like, really far down, but really it moved, like, a couple millimeters, maybe. Yeah, it's really, really hard to easily capture or to, to capture um, the deformation in metals because most of the time, they're just so rigid that it's really hard to see if anything perceivable or perceptible. But uh, because they're so rigid, whenever they do stretch any significant amount chances are it's it's past their uh, their yield strength and they're probably close to failing so this is an example of just a flat sheet if you wanted to add flanges we can see how flanges uh change uh how material behaves in um, in in response to a force so i think i also had a recent one oh there we go So this is just another piece of sheet metal. I think it's the same original uh, width. So it's a it's a foot, but these flanges got bent up a bit. I forget what, exactly what they're, uh, how much they got bent up, two inches, right? So I'm gonna start a new study, go through the exact same things. It's still a uh, 60-61, no, this time it's 50-52. I don't know why that is, I'm gonna change that. Try and keep it consistent. Sometimes this doesn't actually update, so uh, whatever. I'll update it later. Okay, so once again, I'm going to do the same uh, same process. I'm going to start off with a fixture advisor and choose a side that I want to add a fixture to. This is another part where uh, it kind of gets important on understanding how fixtures affect your final simulation. If I had only fixed this bottom part, it would just pivot about that and this whole thing would, uh, would just kind of uh, rotate instead of actually deforming. I can show that after as a separate simulation. And once I have that, I can start in external loads, do the same thing. Uh, Start off on this edge. Oops, gotta add a load. All right. So I'll do it on that edge. I'll choose a selected direction. And excuse me. Maybe. Where is it? Oh, now I'm confused. What the heck? All right, I'm going to cheat a second and go to this one. My, uh, the original study I made and see what I did. Uh, the other side. I don't know what this is different. It's the other side. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, but I chose that. All right, well, that's interesting. I'll try one more time to see if I can figure it out. I guess I can flip these around. I don't think that should change anything. I didn't need to. Yeah, but that would be a very solid work thing to do, wouldn't it? <laughs> if anything, that the other side's on the origin. It should be fine. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it matter at all, but no idea. No, well, the origin side definitely should be fine if it was doing anything weird. Uh, we'll do it like this. 
We'll see if this has to do anything with it. Uh, go to total. <laughs> no, I hate that. What the heck? Not per item. Mm -mm. I don't know why it doesn't work here, but works yeah, in the other. Go back and look at your deflection that you already did. Yeah. Or use the one you already set up. Yeah. Okay. So assuming it works, this is what you should get. Um, I'll still use the two hundred. Yeah, I'll use the two hundred newtons that I had on the other one, and we can compare exactly the the stress and deformation differences between the two. Um, I'll remesh this. We'll keep it coarse so it doesn't take forever to run. And I'll start solving. So do you all have any theories on how exactly it'll deform with the mesh? Uh, I guess we won't find out. It'll just be too fast. OK. So it's kind of funky. Um, all right. So this is what it looks like when it strains. So all the strain really comes from, it looks like what ends up happening is the flange back here kind of ends up buckling a bit inwards. Mm. Oh, no, 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 never mind. This this whole thing ends up being bent. And once again, all that bending uh, uh, deflection and all that bending deformation occurs near the joint. We can see where the stress pops up. So we can see there's a high concentration in stress up here. But even though it still shows up as red, it's still significantly less than what we saw in the other simulation. You can see that the yield strength doesn't even pop up on this scale. Whereas if I go to the other part that I accidentally closed earlier, um, the yield strength, uh, we, we went above the yield strength. So just a simple addition of flanges basically makes this part two times stronger and guarantees that at 200 newtons, this part does not deflect, or this part does not permanently deform. So the displacement or the rel the displacement. Yep. You can see that this is on the mill. This is under 10 millimeters, whereas the other one it di uh, displaced 500 millimeters, or uh, 400 millimeters rather. So just a simple addition of flanges, uh, basically changes that much on your on your factor safety. Uh, if say we wanted to try and uh, flip it around, and we see what happens if we actually try to bend it the other way into the flanges. <clears throat> we can see how that affects uh, affects the final um, numbers too. So rerun this. Well, I will rerun this rather. All right. These numbers are similar. This, uh, let me to make sure that it actually did run. Uh, I'm confused. I'm not sure if these are actually the same. Oh, no, these are different. Okay. All right. Just getting errors left and right. So when it's being compressed like this, it's still experiencing the same amount of stress, a uh, similar amount, but still well below the yield. Um, you can see how it's getting bent up a bit, a little bit like that. We can see the displacement when you um, put it under compression like this, or when you try to bend it up, it actually experiences more deflection. And we can see that the strain all occurs back here still for the, um, uh, causing this to, to bend in a bit. Uh, so enough with like simple sheets and beams. I can go over to the, uh, what do you call it? Yeah, I also have another part lined up that Alan gave me before this presentation started. We have this hook from 2018. So I already modeled this, or I already uh, selected the material to be polycarbonate and this hook was meant to support an entire, how, how heavy was a robot, Alan? Was it 150 pounds that year or no? Probably close. I mean, they always end up close to full weight. <laughs> they always end up being at 150. <laughs> it's like 140 something. 
All right, I'll round that up to 150 to make my results sure. more extreme. It'll be more fun. So I'll go to simulations, start a new study again. And then I'll start a, uh, I'll start new fixtures. If I was good at simulations, I would actually use these bolt holes and, uh, and um, pin holes to actually uh, hold things um, correctly with a, with a connection instead of a, a fixture. But I'm not good at it, so we're going to use a fixture for now. The uh, the assumption still kind of works out in the end because it never really failed. Whenever it did crack, I was talking to Alan about this. Whenever, well, actually, I wasn't talking about Alan about this. No, Whenever I, it did crack, where did it crack? You know? Well, so no, but that's not the. It doesn't really matter here anyway because a lot of times when you're doing pins and stuff, it needs to be in relation to two things. So oh, if you I see. Only I see. Have the one part. It doesn't matter. It, it's interacting the same way, right? I gotcha. I gotcha. Okay. So next, we'll toss this load up here. And uh, can someone look up how many Newtons 150 pounds is? Six hundred and sixty-seven point two. All right. Thank you. So. Sorry, another mesh. So yeah, so the arrows are going up here, right? Because the entire robot's weight was trying to pull this whole thing down. So the hook was having to react against that weight. I'll keep it. I'll do. I'll keep it super coarse for now. Yeah. So I'm going to run the simulation. We can try and predict what's going to happen. Uh, so whenever you do run a simulation on a part, you don't want to see the error that says excessive displacements were calculated. That usually means that you're probably on the wrong track for your design. Um, all right. So we can see how much it actually deforms whenever I uh, toggle this button up here. If you want your entire robot to be resting on this hook, you probably don't want it to be swaying that much just by uh, uh, just by how much it deforms like that. We can check the stresses and see if it actually comes close to yield. And uh, I don't think, okay, interesting. I think it's because uh, it's a plastic. It doesn't technically have a, a yield stress because the, um, the uh, the yield is too difficult to model accurately in plastics. So in metals, it's super linear. If you bend it past a certain point, it'll it won't return. In plastics, it's really difficult to find that point accurately. Yeah, it, it's really far away too. It'll it'll keep plastically deforming until it snaps in a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um. We can also see the displacement. We can see that this hook tip was able to move uh, twenty six millimeters. Uh, it's about half an inch, yeah, right? You can see the strain. We can see whenever it did bend, it was all along this interior curve where the, uh, which is where the, um, uh, the hook actually deformed itself. Uh, yeah, so this is basically just a quick introduction to FEAs and simulations and how uh, solids kind of work on a really high level. Um, I know I rushed through a lot of the theoretical stuff, so please, if you have any questions, let me know. But otherwise, I'm not quite sure. I, I don't think um, I really have anything lined up. What's up, Alan? What was I going to say? So the other thing that is really cool with, that you can do with simulations is uh, actual structural shapes are a lot more interesting, and you can see how they work, right? So if you look at, like, a, um, a piece of extrusion, like a square like tube mm -hmm. um, instead of just like a full square rod or like different thicknesses of tube, you can start seeing what the change in thickness does to how much it'll bend under a certain load. Um, you can also model, um, you can model torsion. So you can see like if, we're, if something's going to twist, like if you had a two by one to see if it was going to twist more than a piece of U channel or something like that. Like a lot of those different geometry things, not just like thickness or material, um, but also just how it's used 
you can do a lot in model into FEA. Um, uh, I can, I think I can go through that real quick. If you'd like me to. Um, if you want to make a tube, yeah, because some one of the ways to do it is you can do you can model. I was gonna do parts. Moments, yeah. Um, what was I say? One of the things, like some, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll model like two parts kind of in the same window or in the same part of the assembly and then set up the simulation to where it's doing them both and you can kind of see it. Um, oh, I see. Okay. Uh, what are we trying to make right now? Uh, just a quick weldment or I thought you could do structural stuff with the, um, which is uh, sketches or do you have to do a 3D sketch? You do have to do a 3D sketch. I see. What are you trying to make? I'm just not sure what you're trying to make. Oh, just like a, um, uh, like a Hue channel, whatever, using the structural stuff. Let's use the, the structural member feature. Okay. I don't know why that's <laughs> faster than just like drawing a U and ex then extruding it, but whatever. <laughs> uh, I can do that too. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll do a two by one and in a, uh, in a U channel. Uh, where's it? Yeah, let's say offset. Uh, 16th wall, yeah. Yeah. All right. And then I'll start the simulation. So, yeah, same thing. All the fixture one side. Um, oh, actually, so you know what we, what we can do since we have this modeled up? So we can see yeah. if you do the force, just like we've been doing for all these models, if you do the force this way going down the two inch side and then do it again, except going down the one inch side. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll do that real quick. Do the typical 200. <laughs> Why not? And I'll go to the mesh advisor, create the mesh, keep it coarse. The common thing to do is that well, people, uh, you'll start off with a really coarse mesh and then you'll slowly step up the, um, the, uh, the detail and plot the, uh, the maximum displacement. And you can see that the displacement will start converging onto a single number. And that's how you can verify and validate that your, uh, your simulation makes sense. But that's a bit extra. Oops, forgot to define the material. Usually 60, 61, right? Uh, for this stuff, yeah. Yeah, okay. All of our extrusion is. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. So, cause we, yeah, since you pushed yeah. it across that, just across that edge, that would make sense. Yeah. But I mean, we can look at that same thing when we do it across the short edge and we'll see the difference. Mm -hmm. But if you look at displacement in here, uh, the other one. Yeah. This other the real one. Yeah. It's over half an inch. Yeah. But yeah. You can tell like basically because of how thin the tube is and the direction, everything, nothing happened back at the, actual fixed mounting point, right? So we're, we're far enough away from it that all of the def deformation is basically near where we're actually pushing, right? Literally nothing happened at the actual fixed part. All right, I can start a new... Uh, yeah, you just edit it right again. I'll rerun the study. You can kind of see how it buckles in a bit like that. Yeah. So yeah, I invite y'all to, to go on SolidWorks at home and then just like mix stuff up and just run simulations on it just to get a better intuition, just get a better feel for how things will change shape when you load them with a bunch of, uh, a bunch uh, of stuff. 
All right, so actually, before yeah. we before we close out, we still have a couple minutes. Um, so that number right there is what seven? No, yeah. so not even. It's minus two, so like point oh seven. So this is before. Yeah, yeah. so this is this is less than a tenth of a uh, of a millimeter. Right. So this, this is definitely shows the exaggeration. So it looks like it's this huge deformation, but in reality, we wouldn't we would not even notice that it moved. Um, if you go back into the model real fast and edit the offset, go make it an eighth inch beam. Oh, I see. Okay. Edit sketch. Yeah. Uh, all right, then you got this. Update. You got to rerun the mesh. Uh, I think it reruns everything when you hit the big run button. I don't. Maybe. Oh, probably not then. You're right. <laughs> like, I can't imagine. Usually, you're right, yeah. All right. So, yeah, now you can see the uh, the um, the deflection is, I think, half, almost a third of what it was originally. Because I think it was 0 0.07, now it's 0 0.026. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So, yeah, it should be third, yeah, something like that. And it depends on over the whole local is going to be different compared to the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, and so, and the reason this looks worse, so it looks like there's more green on this one than there was before. It's just because it's all relative to the maximum, right? So because the other one pushed so much down and the, the red was so much deeper at the tip, um, the rest of it looked just solid blue, even though this one in general, it moved a lot less under the same amount of load. Um, SolidWorks just shows it as more because it's, it's exaggerating based on whatever the most movement is. Uh, do you want to try doing uh, torsion before we saw time, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you're just going to push at a corner or something, right? Or what do you Yeah. Uh, wait, do you want to do torsion through force or do you want to do like oh. real torsion? Oh, I guess you Oh, you can. Yeah, you can. Where you actually have it rotate. Yeah. I'll suppress that for now. Uh, uh, maybe this works. We have to go to the place. Uh, see if that works. Uh, we'll try. Try hundred. See what happens. Oh, that would make sense. Reference axis, yeah, okay. You need to... Try this. Do that instead. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> oh, I can add another force too and make it the other side and try and make it really twist. But I don't know. Uh, we can also compare it to a, a U beam if you want me to make that real quick. Um, or is there anything else that people are interested in? So, like, another place that this gets used is if when we're doing, um, if we wanted to see like the difference in diameter of a tube, like we kind of showed that here a little bit, but that changes a lot to where if you have the same amount of material or similar material, but you just increase the size, um, everything, it gets a lot stiffer. Um, so if you go from a half inch tube to a seven eighths tube to a one and an eighth tube or whatever, outer diameters, and just even if you have the same amount of weight, the whole the thing just gets a lot stiffer and you can see that really easily here. Um, I'm trying to think there's other examples. Um, oh, the other one that gets brought up is um, standoffs versus um, spacers. If you want to go through, if you want to start, start making the U channel, feel free. Okay. Because that I'll have yep. something else to show. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh.
what size are you making your what dimensions are you using? No, no, for you, you can just do two by one again since we already did it. A two by one, you oh, okay, I see. We already did it. So. Wait, you want me to keep with the two by one or do you want me to make a two by one U channel? No, I was saying you could make a two by one U channel and just knock off one of the two inch faces. So it would be like. Oh, uh, that would be smart. Pretty smart. All right, so when you meant by standoffs versus spacers, uh, what did you mean by in this in this context? Oh, no, 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 I wasn't, for this I wasn't, I was just saying, you know, oh, you could do the same, we just show what the difference is when you remove that. I see, that makes more sense now. Um, which is kind of similar to what we already did. I was gonna, I didn't want to model all the standoff versus spacers stuff, I was gonna just pull up where it's already been done. Oh, I gotcha, that makes more sense. Yeah, so like that, that those top inside edges, right? They have no support between them anymore, so they become um, a lot closer in. Uh, ooh, do you want me to fix this top surface and just show what it was like if we assumed that there's like a really, really rigid spacer there? Do you know what I mean or no? You can try. See what that does. Yeah, I don't look like it's much lot. better. <laughs> wow, SolidWorks is really angry today. Oh my lord! All right. Uh, I don't remember if that's less or more displacement from last time. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> Yeah, it should be. I would assume less, but yeah, not really much. Okay, um, if you want to stop sharing real fast, I'm gonna pull up yeah. the document. If you want to continue, oh, I can I can just override apparently because I'm host. Okay. Yep. Okay, so, oop, I started sharing the wrong thing. I think I wanted to share. No, I did share the right one. Okay. Um, it just the little green thing was on the wrong outline. Okay, so this is in our um, resources recommended reading page. Um, it's where we get a lot of. Let me make this bigger for everybody. Um, it's where we get a lot of we like a lot of the laser cut stuff and things we do. Kind of started here, and we've learned our, ourselves as well. Um, but one of the nice things that um, the author did, who's name I'm blanking on at the moment, but he actually, um, he's at MIT, he does some different things and he did, um, he does battle bots as well. Um, and I should know his name, Gal, but I don't remember his first name. Um, either way, part of what he does is in here, he goes through some of the basic FEs for some of the principles for building 
um, robots and building power devices. He builds like go-karts and a bunch of other different things. Um, and part of them, so here's one of the kind of examples, is if you're trying to make a U, it doesn't necessarily work very well when you just have these like two flat plates connected because um, things are very easy to get bent out of shape even with just like a connecting joint between them. Um, so it looks up here, it shows that it's doing like, in this simulation, that looks like a lot, but again, everything is exaggerated by the software to kind of show it. So it's only 0 0.003 um, inches, so tiny, right? Um, but if you go in and you start like boxing it out a little bit, so we get flanges on these. Um, if we still had a wheel spinning here, it would work. I think he actually shows the real thing in a second. Um, those little, just that little addition, which doesn't add a lot of weight, drop the deflection by at least half, probably a little more than half. Um, so that's one of the ways to do that, where just by adding flanges, we can increase the stiffness and make sure things aren't going to bend the way we don't want them to. Um, another one that he does is um, standoffs versus spacers. I think it's in this photo set. Let me get there and make sure. It could be in the next photo set. It's supposed to be 11 images. Okay, it actually might be the next one. Okay, I think it's the next one. Yeah. Okay, so in our normal um, vernacular jargon, whatever, the tube here, so this is like cut straight through. Um, so both these things are round. This one has a bolt going all the way through it. This one has bolts on each side going into threaded um, threaded holes. So these ones we call a standoff, this one we call a spacer. Um, and in general, in here you can see that basically there's one on each side. This one over here is the standoff. So this has a bolt in each side. This one is the spacer, so there's a single bolt going all the way through it. And the standoff deflects a lot more than the spacer. Um, So the problem is though, so actually here, so this is a fully tightened bolt and it doesn't deflect very much. Here's what happens if you loosen the bolt so it's not fully tightened. Um, it's actually worse than fully tightened standoffs. So it's really important that whenever we have a spacer or anything, you tighten it all the way down. So this is one of those places where we can see in simulation something that we know through practice, when we actually make the connections and when we build the robot, we know we need to tighten the bolt. But we can see it here that there is a difference, very noticeably difference in how much something's going to deflect, how much is going to bend, just by if we if we tighten the bolt fully or if we don't. Um, and this doesn't mean just like tighten it to where it can't move. This means like crank it down and fully preload it. Um, what is this? This is with a 500 foot pounds of preload, um, which is not actually that much. Um, we could do more than that. If you run it with the impact driver and things, we can get there. Um, yeah, so very short spans, the effect isn't very much. So like the shorter it is, the more a standoff can be used, except that's actually worse for us since longer spacers have a bigger bolt, they're heavier. Um, it's kind of like what we don't necessarily want to do. Um, but sometimes it's useful to run threaded rod all the way through. So these ones are all, each of these is just a spacer. It has threaded rod all the way through and I'll put nuts on both sides going all the way through it. Um, this is definitely a fun document to go through. Um, oh, he does more of it. So you can see like the different beams um, and how they twist or how they bend. So like an L bracket deflects a lot, U channel a little bit more, square tube less. Um, you can see how much better a square tube is than just like a piece of uh, 80, 20 or any type of extrusion that we want to call it, like rev extrusion, anything like that. Um, in torsion, box tube is way better than U channel or L channel. Um, so if it's trying to resist bending or sorry, twisting. Um, yeah, and this one, one of the most pronounced ones, um, any sort of like 
extrusion that gets the same extrusion stuff that gets used on 3D printers or routers or anything like that. Um, it's really, really bad when you try to twist it. Um, it's very easy to twist compared to just a square box. Um, okay. Um, any questions about anything we covered in the last hour? Um, none of this is anything you're supposed to like do regularly. Like we don't use FEA very often in FRC. Part of it is just to show kind of what it is. Um, if you go into mechanical engineering, you'll have some class on it at some point. You might use it in your job. Um, but it also is just a nice way to like kind of double check some of the things we want to know about um, and kind of get an idea of how, how the best way to build something or why we wouldn't want to use a piece of L channel when we could use box, right? The, yeah, it might be double the weight depending on what we're doing, but if we can use a thinner box, um, what am I trying to say? Oh, so like if we used a, um, somewhere if we had a quarter inch piece of L, so we had quarter inch thick, but it was the same one by one dimension versus using an eighth inch thick square tube, it's gonna be roughly the same weight because you have like double the thickness, but only on two sides compared to half the thickness on all four. The box is gonna be so much stronger in almost any way that we wanna use it than a piece of L. So in most cases, we wanna to try to use um, extrusion when we can, but that doesn't necessarily work with all of our manufacturing processes when we're so easy for us to use sheet. Um, Cause we can do it on the laser or have our sponsors do it or on the router. So a lot of times we'll need to use sheet and we kind of build up our own box structures whenever we can. Uh, okay, any questions, any last thoughts, Ian, before we have to go? Uh, no, not really. I think the document covers basically everything I said, but probably a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a really, really good document. I remember